Welcome back, Tubes. My goal recently has been putting a front subframe back together for the green Gallant VR4. Though it's a unique and somewhat rare car in my country, it's still mostly the same as every first-generation Eclipse, Talon, or Laser that were sold here in large numbers. I know this to be fact because I've been putting a spreadsheet together detailing every single part of the Gallant VR4, broken down by parts groups and production date to confirm it. For the VR4, you'd think there wouldn't be many changes to that recipe since it was such a short run, but surprisingly they did make several. To put my subframe back together, not only do I need to have all the parts clean and ready to go, I need to make sure the stuff that I'm reusing is up to the task and that it will take what I'm going to throw at it. So first, I spent countless hours in front of a wire wheel cleaning and inspecting everything that I've bagged and tagged so far. Inspecting heads and threads, counting parts based on their dimensions and bolt grades, and next I compared how many of them are used across various parts groups because many types of fasteners are used in multiple places. You watch me break a bunch of them when it was coming apart, old crispy fasteners just do that, and that affects your quantities no differently than a rounded off bolt head or damaged threads does. My goal is to replace those, but for the most part I'm reusing whatever I have because I'm finding obtaining parts online to be a nuisance now. Fortunately for me, I've got bins full of all the leftover fasteners from other jobs. I tend to save yellow zinc DSM stuff for a rainy day, and I was able to find about 80% of what I needed to fill those gaps in these bins. Three decades ago, I'm sure that the plating on all these bolts looked great, but not today, and after most of it got wire wheeled off, I then used the same black oxide treatment that I used on this car's engine bolts to try to add an anti-corrosive layer right back onto them again. It's not going to look factory, but it's going to work perfectly on this car in this build. This black oxide treatment is a non-electrolytic, room temperature process made by Caswell and it uses a phosphoric acid bath to chemically change the surface layer of steel to something that won't rust so easily. But beyond developing a hatred for your wire wheel and bench grinder, it doesn't really take very long to produce results like these with it. Some of the zinc plating on my bolts is in great shape, so there's some that I spent less time scrubbing than others, but the longer you spend stripping it on the wire wheel, the better your end results will be. By this stage, even though you've taken precautions to bag parts and label them, even though you've cleaned them in batches to keep them in order, this is the stage where cross-pollination of fasteners might occur that could screw up all of your efforts attempting to keep them together. You'll remember what all those bags looked and felt like before you discarded the bad ones and then completely changed the appearance of all of them like this. This is why it's very important while disassembling your car to document not just the bolt sizes and lengths, but more importantly, bolt grades, because sometimes that's all that's different. Bolt grades matter because the tensile strength and shear strength of the bolt is selected by the engineers based off the function it serves and the loads that are going to affect it. Mitsubishi uses mostly 4s, 7s, 8s, 10s, and 11s. This is the reason why I made that spreadsheet, because no matter how accurate your disassembly is, your bagging and tagging and all your prep, I still need this to regroup and recover all of my inventory and ensure I have the right quantities and parts before I start. All I'm trying to do is put this front subframe back together, and that's all this video is supposed to be, but because the first part that goes into it is a steering rack, that's actually the real problem that I have to solve today. So sorry about the long intro, but that three minutes summarizes the three weeks of bolt cleaning inventory and spreadsheet creation and sorting that brought us here. Most people just buy the $300 remanufactured thing to replace it and avoid rebuilding it. Because let's face it, almost nobody ever rebuilds their own steering rack today. The seal kit's only 26 bucks, yet it's such a weird, mysterious thing to most intelligent people that the $275 difference in price between the seal kit and the remanufactured unit it's a small price to pay for the time and effort that it's going to save them. I'm not going to do this because I'm stupid. I'm doing this because I know there will be a time where I can't get this part. Before I narrate too far ahead of myself, I was originally trying to do something else to solve my problem. You'll see me exert an inordinate amount of focus and effort initially on this housing. It seems ill-timed, just play along. It was just easier to clean it in a blasting cabinet before continuing. There are two roller bearings inside the steering gear housing, one at the top and one at the bottom. In either case, there's a seal on the other side because they're not lubricated by hydraulic oil. They're in a greased portion of the housing instead. So you have to remove the bearing to replace the seal. They press out together easily with just a hammer and a socket or more gently using a hydraulic press. But after that, you need to press the seal and the bearing back in one at a time. That means it's time to cut open that alien looking seal kit that looks like hours of punishment. Whether it's the seal or the bearing, use a socket that matches up with its outer diameter. 
You can very easily press the seal in by hand, and that's my preferred method, but only press on the bearing's outer race. I used the hydraulic press for this despite instructions that said to use a hammer. If you anticipate needing to replace this bearing, there you go. There's your upper shaft bearing part number for Turbo DSM and Gallant VR4 racks. Now it's time for a confession. The reason why I spent so much effort on this part first was because I almost cheated on this job. I almost installed a rebuilt one from a non-turbo Gallant. But what stopped me was two things. Incompatibility and ignorance. I wanted to eliminate the rear steering output from the rack, and I thought that I could use a non-turbo Gallant rack to make it super clean. Makes sense. They didn't have all-wheel steering, but what they do have is a completely different speed-sensitive steering system. They're both Koyo racks, which look extremely similar at a glance, only to look more closely and discover that the orientation of both the lines and the steering column linkage won't line up. There's even supposed to be an electrical part to top it all off, a solenoid threaded into the bottom of the rack that's not on a Gallant VR4. So even though it's a rack from the same chassis, it still won't work. This isn't a big problem to solve for me, just let my misunderstanding of non-turbo Gallants serve as a warning to those of you who might think this is a viable way to delete your all-wheel steering. The only difference in the functionality of the all-wheel steering rack is the inclusion of two hydraulic outputs off the high-pressure lines of the steering cylinder. One output's actually its own separate fitting and port, but the other one's just a T-fitting. They send pressure created by the driver's input at the rack to the rear steering valve, which has its own mechanical hydraulic pump. I wanted a rack with no outputs, but it's not something that I had to have. I thought maybe I could swap steering valve assemblies to accomplish this and save myself a lot of work. The valve assembly differences from the outside seem so minor that you might be able to swap them and fix this imaginary problem. It's easy enough to plug or block just those lines to do the same thing with all-wheel steering racks and continue to use them without any trouble, but perhaps I wouldn't even have to use more than three seals and one nut out of the seal kit just by putting the VR4 steering valve assembly on the rebuilt non-turbo Gallant rack. All of this seemed both probable and logical to me. I mean, if it's just fluid output pressure from the power steering valve that controls the rear steering, and they spent all those resources engineering the part for specifically a 91 Gallant's physics, then why would Koyo completely re-engineer two different racks for the same chassis? Why retool your production? That's expensive. Oh no. It's different. Something changed. Your darn toot and coil retooled for the completely different rack. The steering gear shafts are completely different. There's two extra seals and lots of fancy speed sensitive valving and machining all throughout this piece. Look at that. That's fancy. Looks like money. The height difference makes it obvious that more than the housing would need to be swapped. So the next logical course of action would be to remove the plug off the bottom of the rack with a 24 millimeter wrench so you can get to the 17 millimeter single use locking nut that's on the bottom of the shaft. I use a brass punch to remove the shaft because there's a seal involved and also because there's a needle roller bearing that I don't want to destroy. And I can already tell you based on what I already see that this isn't going to work at all. The sizes of the steering pinion gear are completely different which means the steering rod and the internals and everything inside this rack is going to be different. Yeah. Completely different. Mm-hmm. Completely different. It isn't gonna work. Dang it. Where I'm now ignorant is whether or not attempting to use a DSM rack would change the turning radius of a Gallant. The Gallant has a much tighter turning radius by several feet over an all-wheel drive DSM, but that could be due to the rack, the knuckles, or maybe even both, I don't know. There's an additional unknown related to the amount of time that would pass for me to learn that, too. And I'm sure someone's already typing it in the comments, but in order for me to get one step closer to my ultimate goal of just reassembling the green Gallant's front subframe, I'm going to accept having plug lines in my steering rack and just rebuild the original Gallant rack instead. If I can. And so the story changes again. And this is once again how we got to this point. The reason I said if, everything hinges on whether or not I have the right seal kit, the right tools to do this correctly, and if the internal parts are even good enough to be reusable to begin with. To figure all that out, we need to see the inside of it. I'd like to take the inner tie rods off like really bad, but even with the washers unstaked and my poor selection of wrenches for things this large, it's presenting me with a challenge. I'm man enough to admit that. I'll get Matt's help with this in a minute. For now, I'm just gonna move on to show you how weird it is to get into this thing. The stopper in the rack is safety wired into it. Turn it clockwise to expose the back end of the wire. 
and then turn it counterclockwise to feed that wire back out of that tiny little hole. When you get onto the other end of it, it just lifts right out. It's easier with the tie rod end removed because you don't have to reach around the steering shaft with needle nose pliers, but you can see that you can do this either way. Not so hard. I still need to get those tie rod ends off because they're not going to fit through the rack when I try to remove the steering shaft and I need to see its guts, so I got to do that. Matt couldn't find his big wrench either. We all had the same stuff, so basically Yay. we just used my channel locks in conjunction with some extra hands and a bench vise to make up the difference. Around. a big crescent wrench. Do you have any over, size, over one inch size crescents anywhere? One and an eighth? One and I had, had one, I just can't find it. Whoa, good job dude. Thank you. You gonna feel that tomorrow? No. Okay. Oh, you just found it. <laughs> Way she goes. It's typical just to find worn seals or busted lines, but if there was contamination of the power steering fluid, which does absorb humidity, then the internal parts could be rusty too. With the stopper gone, you can often remove the bushing just by pushing the steering rod in and back out again. And at this point, even though I didn't take the rack support spring out, you can remove the steering gear shaft. It only comes out one way from the hydraulic cylinder end, not the gear end, but this poses some challenges during reassembly that you'll have to take some extra precautions for because you'd have to scrape those sharp gear teeth across all of your brand new fresh seals. That's less than ideal. But for now I'm going to use a brass punch to tap it out because I didn't remove the spring-loaded rack support yet. I'll show you how to do that one later. It's a supporter, not a stopper. But sadly, the shaft is corroded from moisture contamination as well as damage from being run dry. If I had a lathe, some of that could have been cleaned up, but the deep rusty pitting in some places would not. So I need a new steering shaft to fix this one. Don't worry, you know I've got that covered. The next order of business and the only thing left inside of this housing is the inner oil seal and the backup washer. To remove those, you just need a rod slim enough to fit through the housing against the edge of the washer and the seal and tap around its circumference to drop the seal out. When you get the seal, the washer falls out with it. I'm now going to clean and prepare the pinion gear housing in the cylinder for reassembly, but while I do that, because you know what that involves, I'm going to explain that backup washer. It's the innermost part of the cylinder assembly. It's very slightly smaller than the inner hydraulic oil seal because it fits into a tapered section of the rack where the steel tube is swaged at the end of the cylinder. It's a trick washer because it's actually also the inner stopper and bushing, withstanding all of the hydraulic load whenever the wheels of the car turn fully to the right. Even though it fits loosely into the rack, the seal boss is in front of it, and the seal needs that washer there to keep itself from blowing out inside the rack's pinion gear housing every bit as much as the rack needs to have a stopper and a bushing on both ends of it. All I did for blasting prep was put all the plugs and hydraulic lines back into all the ports, stuff the cylinder and gear housing ends with rags and tape, and throw the whole thing right into the cabinet. It wouldn't fit in there like this with the tie rod ends still in place, or else I'd have done it then. I just have wanted to mask the torn boots first that were on it because you really don't want to blast the steering shaft. It's highly polished to prevent damaging oil seals. But it's really hard to keep all that blasting media out of this thing no matter how good of a prep job you do. So if you blast your steering rack to clean it up, fully clean and degrease it inside and out with solvents and compressed air after you're done. The ultimate goal is to keep all the fluids on the inside of the rack and contaminating it doesn't help. But that was something this rack didn't do before I started. It was leaking from three places. Both ends of the rack, plus from somewhere behind it in the middle that I couldn't even see when it was in the car. But, you know, now here it is, all broken down with its important parts that all have to be dealt with. The pitted shaft likely wore out the seals on both ends of the cylinder, and the shaft is bad. The rest of the other parts look great for the most part, but let's take a look at those lines, shall we? It's got a crack in it right there, see? Right there. See, so it's cracked. So that's the third leak I saw that I couldn't figure out. And now I need another set of lines for it too. 
You could painstakingly make those, but my friend Travis sent me his old steering rack that he intelligently replaced with the rebuilt unit. And now I can take a shot at seeing if any of the stuff that I need to complete this one that I just blew apart is here. Even though all the lines on it look a little bit rusty, I think there's enough left of them to have a nice long life. I'll blast and clean these up to inspect them further in a little bit, but first I want to show you an example of an uncooperative stopper. No matter how hard I tried, I could not turn the stopper clockwise. The wire rusted in place so hard against the outer housing it wouldn't budge, so I couldn't get this end of the wire to rotate inside the hole. You can't get the stopper out unless you remove the wire first. For whatever reason, I was able to get it to turn counterclockwise and bend the wire enough so that I could grip it with pliers and still manage to pull it out. You might be able to get it to do the same thing with a chisel, but don't cut the wire or now you'll have two things stuck inside the groove that you'll have to fish out. Do your best to keep the wire intact. You also don't need to carefully remove the stopper ring or the bushing either. And you know, one at a time like you would for a YouTube video, yeah. You can just shove the whole steering shaft out of the cylinder side with it all stacked up on it like an assembly. The only thing holding all that in there is just that one piece of wire. And there's the steering shaft. This one's in spectacular shape compared to mine. There's some visible signs of wear, just a little bit of discoloration on it, but there's absolutely nothing that you can feel with your fingernail. I call that a win. Triple or quadruple win even, because there's also a good pair of lines and outer tie rod ends that are in perfect condition unlike mine. I know most people would prefer a brand new part over reusing an old one, but oftentimes new aftermarket doesn't match the same quality of good old OEM, so I'm ecstatic to have all of this. Two videos in a row where stuff that some people consider junk goes on to live a new life. It feels good to be a part of this cycle of sustainability, and I encourage everyone with a car out there to try it sometime. If I ever have trouble with these lines, they're something that I can fabricate new and replace without having to disassemble this whole rack. I used earplugs to protect the insides of them from cleaning, blasting, sanding, and inspection processes that followed, which involved hand sanding too to ensure that there's no rot, no cracks, and before cleaning them all out with brake cleaner and then blowing them all out with compressed air. I got lucky for two reasons on these, because I needed the lines to block all the hydraulic ports for what comes next, and you didn't have to watch me fabricate a set of these things, and I didn't have to edit it, so there's other great videos on the tubes about making hydraulic lines. Just a few more minor bits of preparation, and then it all gets coated in gloss black. While that dries, I'm going to go ahead and prep all the rest of these parts, pick the winners and losers for this assembly, and take the best of these two racks to make one like new rack. Let's start with the rack bushings. Just like the inner seal and the backup washer, you just use a punch, albeit a much smaller one, to drive the pressed in seal out the other side of it. That's easy enough. Next is just a regular old O-ring and all that comes in the seal kit. This bushing doesn't travel inside the rack, so that O-ring usually holds up pretty well. The inner seal is more likely to wear out long before that O-ring does. And of course I have two of these to pick from. Neither of them are showing any unusual wear, so I'm going to keep the original one that was already in the cylinder to begin with. Now, with the paint dry and everything clean, I can take this thing back apart again and start the final assembly. I painted only an empty shell of a steering rack. That rack support assembly that I mentioned earlier. Observe my 83 cent solution to the $46 plus shipping and handling tool. The support cover is a 24 millimeter hex and nobody has that size Allen wrench waiting around for this rainy day. I mean, that's, that's an inch thick practically, but if you pick up a 5 8 inch 11 thread nut from your local hardware store for 49 cents, give Uncle Sam his cut for your problem that he had nothing to do with in the form of sales tax, and then add another quarter to the hole for reinforcement support so that it sticks up high enough to get a socket on it, then you can use your impact wrench to blast that thing right off. It's not a perfect fit, it just lets you do the same thing. It's enough. But what's more, it's not $46 plus shipping. This method costs like 100 times less and it gives you a quarter change when you're finished. All that makes Uncle Sam sad because he wants his cut of that $46 socket really bad. Let's prep that steering gear shaft though. If you were concerned about the texture of the shaft, you could put a new one on there with steel wool, but I'm not going beyond the chemical approach because I don't see any reason why it needs it. Two seals. Both stacked right on top of each other. First you've got a Teflon O-ring, then a plain old EPDM O-ring that serves as a sort of support and tensioner for the Teflon ring. The seals for the shaft are in the kit and easily identified because one fits exactly and immediately inside the largest Teflon ring's inner diameter. 
Installation is the reverse of assembly, although you'll need to add some ATF to the seal boss and pre-stretch your Teflon seals first. They get stiff in the package and pre-stretching and warming them up helps you install them, just get them pliable again. Don't go wild with the stretching part because Teflon seals don't spring back into shape like regular old O-rings do. After you install them, you typically need to smash them back down and shrink them again. ATF, Mitsubishi Automatic Transmission Fluid, or Dextron 2, is the recommended assembly lube that's used in the manual, everywhere that you're putting this stuff together. I put it in all the O-ring seal bosses because the manual says to. The control valve assembly has four, and like you saw, sometimes six or even more Teflon seals in it. This one, this car with a complicated all-wheel steering system, only has the minimum requirement of four just like every single other simple hydraulic two-wheel steering system would. Removing them is easy because like any seal you're replacing, you don't have to be careful. Just go ahead and jam your hook into them and stretch away or cut them, whatever. Just, you know, when you're installing them though, use plenty of lube, pre-stretch your new seals, and be careful. Keeping all the pressurized fluids only where it's supposed to be is how you do this correctly. Sometimes you'll find stretching them over existing seals works easier than stretching them an extra millimeter over the opposite end when it's a little bit bigger on one side. You know, anything you can do to prevent stretching and overstretching your gaskets, do it. They make special tools to help people, re you know, replace the Teflon seals. They're like seal shrinkers, and like this one here that nobody watching this probably has in their toolbox because it's a Mitsubishi OE seal installer tool for a hydraulic DSM rack. I bought this over a decade ago not even knowing what it was at the time. I just knew it was in the service manual and so I figured I needed it. Uncle Sam got me good on this one. I, he, I didn't even care. But if you don't have this, you can use a piece of cut soda bottle and a worm gear clamp. Some people have used multiple layers of electrical tape and then put them in the freezer afterwards. There's lots of other ways to do this, and I did a pretty good job of not stretching these, but the tool I have is tapered. It's the perfect diameter for the control valve, and I'm just going to drive it once all the way through from the tapered side and then immediately install it into the housing. Whether or not I ever use this tool again depends on whether or not I ever have another steering rack problem, but I enjoyed showing you the thing that's in the service manual, that it does exist even if you can't find it. And that's all that thing does. Grease the upper pinion shaft bearing before installing the shaft. This is the bottom oil seal for the control valve housing, and I just mash it in by hand. The manual says this is a critical oil seal and to leave it protruding one millimeter above the boss or you will experience an oil leak after assembly. You can measure off the face of the sealed boss with the back of your digital caliper like I did, but this is the result that mine produced. Look, look at that up close. It completes the seal once you torque the housing bolts down. Even though there are open hydraulic ports, I still poured ATF in there and worked it around to keep it all greasy. And we'll set that aside until we're done installing the gear shaft. Assembly preparation is best described as purposeful because all of it is really easy, but it's a process where a simple mistake means complete failure. You may have to do this assembly several times to get it right the first time, or supposedly the right seal kit might have the wrong size seal in it, like one of my kits did. I had to use two different seal kits to rebuild this rack. The Edelman kit had the right inner steering shaft seal that I needed, but it came with the wrong lower pinion shaft seal. So either way, I would have still needed to buy both kits at twice the cost of parts than it should have cost. It happens to all of us, except when it doesn't. I'm sure only one of you out there watching has always gotten the right part, and you'll tell me in the comments. But anyway, I pressed that bushing seal in with my bare hands, and I stretched a new O-ring over it like a boss. Next, I dropped the backing washer for the inner seal, ensuring that it was in there flat and straight. And then I dropped a new seal directly into the seal boss, first try, swish. You want it installed with the spring side facing you in the hole. Nah, just kidding, you just have to drive it in there with a socket, and I used a socket extension that was just ever so slightly smaller than the seal diameter to fully seat it. But you have to be careful when installing the shaft through that seal not to knock that spring right out of its hole, or else the whole job is a fail. All the sharp edges pose a risk of cutting seals just as badly as the jagged gear shaft does at wiggling that spring right out of its seat. So I'm wrapping the shaft from just below the gears with tape. I'm using polyester tape, but plain old packing tape would also work fine for a whole lot less money. It's just not quite as tough. You'll essentially be installing the shaft backwards from the way the seal wants to accept it. And once it's installed, you can't look down inside it and see it on either side anymore, so you have to be really careful. 
lubricate the taped shaft with ATF. Ensure there are no sharp corners at the end of it that might snag the seal and twist the shaft as you install it through that inner seal. If you shake it when you're done and nothing rattles, that's a good sign. You can also look through the inner pressure port when the line's removed and see if you can see that seal spring sliding back and forth on the shaft as you tilt it, if you don't believe your ears. If the shaft moves smoothly and you don't see or hear anything wrong, go ahead and continue. It can help to use a tool with a fine curved edge to press the seal around the shaft to avoid cutting its inner lip. Alternatively, you can also do what the manual says and tape it up. And there's the stopper ring. Now all I have to do is feed it a new wire, which you need a little bit more leverage for than you do with the used one. But whatever, fancy new wire, whoopee! And now I'm gonna grease this thing liberally with the Mitsubishi Mystery Grease. I know that they don't want me using this general purpose grease kind of stuff for this, because whenever that's referenced, it's either referred to as general purpose grease or I'm given a part number that cross-references to an equivalent of it. This Lobro kit grease is used in a drive shaft CV joint, so it's a load-bearing grease and steering is definitely a load-bearing activity. These bottles come in measured quantities for use in a Lobro joint, but there's not enough free space inside this rack to even fit it all so I'm just gooping it in there and letting it settle however it can and if it's too much oh well. The excess will run out the wide open hole on the driver's side and into the inner tie rod boot once it's all assembled and installed. It might even run back in there again if you make really quick left hand turns on a hot day. But it's really sticky grease so none of that's really a problem if you've got a good boot. Next to seal up the pinion gear housing. Torque the pinion gear lock nut to 45 foot pounds. Manual says 36 to 51 and 45's right up there, so that's what I'm going with. It says to use thread sealant. I'm gonna use blue Loctite for this because there's a greasy rotating thing on the other side of it. And this plug does not have a tapered thread. This thing acts as some sort of support for the pinion gear and I really don't want it to back out. Blue Loctite should work just fine to hold itself and the grease in. So just thread it fingertip tight to the bottom because inch pounds. And then do one more thing. You can see here on the side where the factory did it before. You stake the threads in two places with a punch to jam the plug into place. That ain't going nowhere. On the other side, gotta make sure those control valve bolts are on there good and tight. I learned that hand tight with a socket, I can do 11 foot pounds. That's gonna be a significant thing in a moment because I'm gonna take all the mystery out of the rack support assembly for you with it. Lots of people fear the complexity of setting tension on spring-loaded things, but this one's really, really easy. The rack support assembly is just a threaded plug, a big old square threaded lock nut ring thing, and a plunger with a bearing-laden face that rests against the steering shaft. It has a spring pocket, so there's a spring of course, a fairly stiff one that goes between the plunger and the plug. And before you install the plug, first apply a hefty layer of thread sealant to these coarse threads. This plug is oriented on the bottom rear of the rack. The threads are fairly coarse, so when you, know, when you install it, it could make a mess if you don't. I just use Permatex thread sealer, same thing as Loctite 567. So what you do is you set it by using that 84 cent socket trick to hand tighten the plug all the way until it stops. The service manual says to torque it 11 foot pounds. How about that? That's when the spring's compressed and the rack goes into bind. You'll feel it doing that by hand with the socket because it's a 10 pound spring. You get it? Hand tight. In this current state, there should be enough pressure to completely stop the rack so that the cheap tool I'm about to show you next doesn't work. I used my most useless socket in my toolbox, my 12.18 millimeter that had enough room to squeeze four layers of a shop rag down over the spine pinion shaft and smash the rag. This let me adapt it down to a needle style or a bicycle style inch pound torque wrench with enough grip for this test. But with the rack support plug buried, it's too much resistance for the rag to turn it. The tool's gonna slip and you see the rag does that right between 16 and 17 inch pounds. The target the service manual wants to see is five to 11 inch pounds. Both are less than one foot pound, well below the grip strength of that rag. And it should save you at least another 50 bu or 60 bucks on that fancy socket and all the time waiting for it to show up. But anyway, setting the plug, back the stopper off 60 degrees and test the resistance. I'm gonna go 90. And like I said, test the resistance to see if you're hitting between the target values of five to 11 inch pounds while rotating one full sweep within four to six seconds time. And I've nailed it. It's right between eight and nine pounds. Camera angles matter, and when I rotate the tool at the requested speed, my camera only gets a blurry shot. But this is all there is to it. You get it. Now, with a good result, you just tighten the square lock ring around the plug and let all your sealant set up. 
And now that the rack support is set, I'm gonna install the lines last because if I had done them first, they'd have been completely in the way of doing all of that. Make sure you put an O-ring on every single one of the flared fittings on the lines and make sure there's not already an O-ring inside any of the ports that you're installing them into. Hand tighten them all and give them a smack. Once again, my seal kits came up short. I have to source one of the two O-rings that I needed for the banjo fitting in the bolt. So I had to get that from my own pile and tighten that one down all the way hand tight. I've got another little surprise for you right here. I preserved the original Koyo part sticker since it was in really good shape to begin with. I thought that would be a nice little touch after going through all this work. Inner tie rods go on next, or the stake washers do, I should say. The tie rods go through those. Honk them down against each other best you got and then flatten the ends of the stake washers around the inner tie rod ends. Doesn't that make you happy? It makes me happy. Thank you, Travis. Boots. Maybe these might be a little bit smaller than I wanted them to be, but they'll work. Just to let you know, if you search that part number on the bag, it isn't the perfect one, but it's perfect for me because it's not stretched so tight that it's trying to split. They're the right length, and I had to use the best clips to secure them from both seal kits to complete one OE looking set. Yet the band clamps were very poorly stamped, and in a way that made them nearly impossible to operate with the very tool designed to operate them. But with a tunnel fettling, I got it, and I put the smack down on each one with a hammer. Nice. Tidy clean, tested. Oh yeah, the control valve bolts are only on hand tight right now, remember? They're supposed to be between 12 and 19 foot pounds and supposed to also have some thread locker on them as well. I went with 17 foot pounds. I feel more empowered when they give me a range to pick from, like, you know, pick a number. Nice to have that sorted though. Check to make sure all your lines and fittings and lock rings are tight. I don't want to have to see it again anytime soon, just because, like I said in this video, all I really wanted to do was start reassembling this candy-like, shiny front subframe. That's all I've been wanting to do. What a month of preparation has all been about here, and rebuilding this rack. I want it really bad, and those black oxide bolts look absolutely amazing in there. But it turns out this was really a Koyo power steering rack rebuild video after all. It's because the first thing that goes into section 33-050 front subframe is section 37-050 power steering gear assembly. Good as new, end to end, and ready to go another round. Quality inspected by Jaffro. It took two seal kits, about 80 bucks in tools I didn't have, despite access to some really pretty amazing facilities and rare artifacts in my tool collection as well to help me do this. But that expense is mostly wrenches over 24 millimeters in diameter and sealants. Probably 20 bucks is boots and everything else was recycled like you saw. It's as if you have a bag of rubber bands to have to replace. It's just a, it's simply just a process. As long as you understand the process, you'll do it right. Of course, to complete section 3750, I'm gonna need some tie rod ends, and I chose the sealed Dorman units for my otherwise stock front knuckle assemblies. Section 26150 front knuckle and brake assembly is connected to section 33110 front suspension, is connected to section 33050 front subframe assembly, and that all connects to the chassis. The front steering rack was just in my way of doing this. It never made my drawing, and if it was in my drawing right now, I'd erase it. You're done, 3750. I have 33110 sorted already. There's the springs and struts already cleaned up and refurbished with all my best parts in the trunk. I kept those strut assemblies inside a camouflage tarp so they couldn't see their old friends. But here they all are, waiting for them. Everything else is here to be reunited with this front subframe, but that's going to be the next episode. Thank you for watching. Hit that like button if I entertained you, taught you something, gave you an idea, or saved you some money. But most importantly, give my Patreon supporters a huge shout out, whom without their help, I would not be able to afford to produce and deliver this informative, fun, and purposeful content. Those guys get it. If you want a thing, you gotta work to have it, and I'm here on YouTube showing all of you how I do it. I'll be back again soon with section 33050 and 110 very soon. So until next time, Happy New Year and stay tubed!